So uh, I also want to point out that many of our community artists have brought flyers and brochures that are on the table on the opposite side of that wall. So if you're interested in pursuing their work further, just around the back. Uh, so we have four chairs. So we need four you-know-whats. So Natalie Kahn, this will all become clear in one moment. Perfect. Technical difficulty. Natalie's 21. I just want to point out. <laughs> Natalie has to read now. Wait, can there, there's more. We don't have more chairs. Oh, okay. Should we get more chairs? Wait, should we use like these chairs? Okay, we'll read. Oh yeah, if anyone wants that. Um, okay. So. Thank you to all of the drunken nitwits who showed up. Um, we have one more chair. Okay. Um, anyway. This is called A Good Place to Knit or A Yarn About Yarn. Um, an animal ethicist, a union organizer, an airport, airport employee trainer, an urban landscape architect, a professional fiber artist, a political science professor, and about 20 other characters walk into a bar. They pull out their knitting needles. On a cold evening at the end of February, about 20 knitters fill two long tables at Vietnam Palace in Philadelphia's Chinatown, where the walls are covered in what look like stock photos of what I assume is Vietnam. The location changes every week, but the squad get-togethers are always on Wednesdays. They start at 5.30 and wrap up around 8.30, though some members partake in an after-party that usually involves bubble tea or grocery shopping. Over, over Vietnam Palace's ginger martinis and rice and tofu, members add stitches to whatever knitting projects they have going, the blankets, sweaters, and scarves they have been working on for weeks or even months, both at these meetings and at home. Two weeks later, on an early March hump day, a greater turnout of group members stitch while enjoying the margaritas and $5 happy hour taco, tapas at a Mexican restaurant and bar called Lucia Cartel. Allison, a bespectacled, nose-ringed, and vegan professor who wears a lot of black and researches the intersection of animals and religion, is the founder and the leader of the group. She suggests that this night's numbers could be because long-term member Abdi is moving to Detroit and everyone wants to see her off. Abdi jokes that if she can't find a good knitting group in Detroit, then she'll, add the she'll attend the Philadelphia meetups via FaceTime. And at some point during both nights, pictures are taken of the group for social media. Both times, I try to escape the camera, but I fail. <laughs> These are the drunken newits, Philadelphia's self-proclaimed self youthful knitting group. I'm not a good judge of age, but the youngest member I see seems to be in her 20s and the oldest appear over 60. There are members in their 30s, 40s, and 50s too. Some wear, some wear wooden name tags engraved with the knitwits upside down wine glass, yarn, and knitting needles logo. Allison says she ordered these from Etsy using the $30 annual membership dues that the participants pay. Allison, whose official title is Chief Nitwit, credits social media for this younger age demographic. She said when she moved to Philadelphia, she tried other knitting groups but felt out of place when the members were showing her the items they had knitted for their grandbabies. And as she'd been in the original Drunken Nitwits chapter that started in Oxford, England, she decided to create an offshoot in Philadelphia when she moved there in 2017. Though her first few meetings saw low attendance, she had her lucky break four weeks in, when the Nitwits absorbed another knitting group who lost its venue. There are 10 nitwits, as they nickname themselves, units across the globe, spanning the United States, England, and Australia. According to DrunkenNitwits.com, the nitwits provide themselves upon making a handcrafted item whose place, time, and method of construction cannot entirely be recalled. <laughs> At the Philadelphia Wednesday get-togethers, I notice each nitwit finishes about one to two adult beverages. Though I am no arbiter of knitting merit, the stitches they add appear to be in neat rows. The other diners in the establishment go about their dinners and dates with minimal glances toward the nitwits. I am told by many members, many times, of a retreat in the Poconos that occurred within the past year where there was so much alcohol it was almost embarrassing. Allison had to rip out everything she did. Tara positioned the armpit of her sweater in the wrong spot. Francesca crossed the cables on her sweater she was making and she didn't even notice until she got home. <laughs> there are also reports of making s'mores, though the vegan marshmallows didn't melt, and dyeing yarn, which did not turn out as vibrant as expected. Allison is working on a purple shawl. Is she? <laughs> <laughs> 
But she's worried about finding that effortless way to wear it. So she doesn't look, as she puts it, like she is in a nursing home waiting to die. <laughs> she brings her supplies with her in a tote bag with ball sack emblazoned on it alongside the Nitwits logo. Do you have it with you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see another member has a ball sack as well. While we're on the subject, Allison tells me about the convention the knitwits from all the global chapters wanted to have, entitled the Drunken International Conference of Knitters, Dick for short. They, <laughs> they wanted to have it in a town called Vag, according to Allison, located somewhere in South America, but it turned out there was no airport there. Besides, <laughs> besides Allison adds, a lot of our lesbian members were like, that's not what necessarily goes there. So they had the conference in Oxford instead. It was still called Dick. God. Speaking of dick, the Nuits are mostly women, and there are a few token males. Alice, Alan attends with his girlfriend, Megan. He taught her to knit, though he says she's now better at it than he is. He and Megan both show up in hats and scarves they knitted themselves. And I learned that Megan also made the slouchy, fitted blue sweater she's wearing, which looks like something I owned from Express, just nicer. Allison, Alan admits he doesn't tell people he's in a knitting group. Allison says she does, but only if they're cool. She also kicks people out of the online meetup.com group if they don't show up to meetings for a year. She justifies, I don't like dead stock. <laughs> Francesca has been coming to Knitwits for a year. She wears purple eyeshadow, pink glittery lipstick, a bright pink shirt, and a blue pashmina scarf. She cannot knit and talk at the same time because she uses too many hand gestures. She, jo <laughs> she, joined, the <laughs> she joined the Knitwits because she needed people to discuss yarn with. She said her friends kept feeling like, here she is talking about yarn again. After all, not everyone speaks the knitting lingo you find on the discussion boards on Ravelry.com or pays attention to the how fast can you knit a pair of socks challenges, for which the record seems to be about a day or two if you don't sleep and are already an efficient knitter. The Knitwits do have much to discuss regarding yarn. Francesca explains her innovation of wrapping her fingers in patterned washi tape because she kept stabbing herself with the knitting needles. Someone comments that she even chose a cute variety of tape, to which Francesca responds that first she tried regular scotch tape but kept stabbing through that too. Everyone buys too much yarn and then never uses some of it because it's just too good for a project. Maria, who likes to knit leg warmers and wear them while walking to the gym, says how dangerous it is to live in such proximity to both loop and yarnphoria. I don't know if I'm a weirdo, but I follow so many yarn places on Instagram, she adds. Alan confesses to buying fake mink yarn, which was labeled 100% mink, but turned out to be 0% mink because there is no such thing as mink yarn. <laughs> Who goes around selling counterfeit yarn, someone asks. <laughs> this leads to a discussion about what kind of yarn is the most ethical. At least rayon is made from plants. Someone interjects about the cartoons of people knitting and that they're wrong. Why would the needles point inward? That's not how you knit. Several nitwits demonstrate this and laugh, contorting their faces into the maniacal expressions you see in the cartoon characters of old people knitting and the needles pointed inward. <laughs> um, when the yarns about yarn wind down, the nitwits unravel their personal lives. <laughs> Debbie, whose wiry curled hair is dyed the color of grenadine, is a political science professor at Villanova. She hires a particular second semester senior who has failed to do both his literature review and project proposal. Um, I just lost my place. Though the class she teaches is a graduation requirement. She describes the individual, saying he's well-spoken and well-dressed, so this behavior confuses her. Allison asks if he's attractive, and I guess an effort to better understand the student's arrogance, to which Debbie responds that he's, quote, white guy average, followed by a glance at me and an exclamation of, do not quote me. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um. <laughs> Francesca has mentioned a boyfriend a few times, and Allison asks how long they've been together. Francesca says it's been four years, and then explains how he's the ticket taker on the train she takes to work and had flirted with her while she was previously married. She talks about their first kiss outside of the Capogiro in Center City, like the movies, where she imagined a camera zooming in and everything, and then she backtracks to when she was attracted to him for the first time, when she saw him up against the train door with the sun reflecting off his tattooed skin. She acts out his posture and muscles, her fragment of mock turtleneck untouched on the table for many minutes. The three nitwits across the table from Francesca, their fingers stitching in relative synchronicity, ask how this boyfriend feels about the knitting. Francesca says he's generally reserved, just lets her do her thing without asking too many questions. Maria responds that her husband tells her to keep knitting because she owns too much yarn. <laughs> <laughs> much of what the nitwits say ties back to their craft. Francesca talks about how she used to get her hair done a lot, until she got divorced, but that it's growing in because she lost four inches of it. Someone asks why, and lo and behold, the story has to do with knitting. Though she wants to clarify that she is not a hat wearer, Francesca says she knitted a wool hat, the first cable hat she'd ever made, and she was so proud of it that she wore it every day. 
Then, at Vogue Knitting Live, a knitting convention in New York, someone stole it, which Allison says Francesca should take as a compliment. Later, <laughs> later, Francesca noticed her hair was falling out, and she realized it was because the wool hat didn't have a lining, so it rubbed against her hair until it fell out. <laughs> but now that's the hat thief's problem. Allison butts in, I just want their hair to fall out as vengeance. The conversation goes back to being in a hair salon and how much time one can spend there. Someone interjects, it's probably a good place to knit. Thank you. Great. Oh, oh no. Thank you, Nitwits. Watch out for your bottle. It's it's crazy up here with the Nitwits. Next up, Hannah, will you start and then Daisy will read? Is that all right? Okay, while we make transition. I don't think it matters. Okay, Hannah Wallace, followed by Daisy Angelis. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. evening. Uh, yes, uh, so my name is Hannah Wallace. Um, I am the Educational Programming Manager at the African American Museum. I'm also a fellow at the Colored Girls Museum up in Germantown. Um, and I'm also a fifth generation loom weaver, uh, so I keep busy. Um, I am going to, these pictures are so small, I'm just going to pass them around. Um, but these are photos of my family and the weavers that have been in my family over the past five generations. Uh, so yeah, please take a look. Uh, so I wrote up a, a short, very short poem, and I'll, then I'll just get into uh, more about the practice itself. Um, but yes, so woven through five generations, uh, from Hannah to John to Mary to Joyce, and then to Hannah. There may be more. Uh, we only know back to five generations. Um, from Sweden to Canada to Minnesota, Minnesota, if you want to say it correctly, <laughs> uh, to Pennsylvania. Uh, from black, oh, f excuse me, from white to black, and I bet they didn't expect that. <laughs> um, woven because it's what we know, because it brings me to them and back again. Over, under, through, over, under, and back again. Pull it tight, not too tight, let it breathe, and pass it on. Uh, so that was a, just a poem that I wanted to write about, um, just about the family and about the practice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, so my family's practice of loom weaving uh, goes back to goes back to my great 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 grandmother Hannah. Um, I wasn't named after her; it was actually after the fact that they remembered that her name was Hannah. <laughs> I was like, Thanks, mom. Um, uh, but my mo my mother uh, taught me how to weave. Um, I started learning when I was about uh, 19 years old. I was I was at Temple University studying for undergrad, and um, Aside from my work, I just wanted to be able to make some money, which is not a beautiful way to start. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but of course, I was sitting on this all my life, um, and I saw my mom getting on the loom just about every, every evening. Um, so you know, I asked her one day just to see if she could teach me, um, and I've been her apprentice ever since. I'm still learning, I'm still learning. I don't know how to set up the loom yet. I think that'll be you know, when I can say I'm a master, is when you actually know how to tie all those hundreds of strings correctly. Um, uh, before before my mother, uh, she was taught by my grandmother Mary uh, up in Minnesota, um, and, and my grandmother was taught by her husband. It was actually in the mainly in the men's side of the family. Her husband uh, uh, Norman, you'll see in the photos there, uh, and uh, his father John O. Johnson, um, and back to my grandmother Hannah. 
Um, so these are these are called rag rugs, and actually what you see here, this is a rug made by my grandmother at the bottom, and then a rug made by my mother in the middle here, and then a rug made by me at the top. Um, <laughs> so I, I wish I had rugs uh, by my uh, great grandfather and great 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 grandmother. Um, I just we just didn't think to to keep them. We always wanted to sell them. Um, I still sell them, so if you're interested, I do sell rugs. Um, <laughs> um, my grandfather's loom is actually saved up in a museum up in uh, up in northern Minnesota, a place called Pioneer Village. Um, and I always find it interesting the conversations that come out of this now. That you know, thinking about the pioneers uh, from a, from a black perspective, uh, this is where I say I doubt they expected um, you know a great 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 grandchild who's African American because um, there's so many conversations to come from that I'm still kind of working through in my own head um, but this is something that you know I just find it so so wonderful it, it makes so much sense whenever I go back home and they see my weaving um, although there there's clearly barriers um, so many barriers <laughs> um, regarding race uh, I do love my family um, but there is of course going to be barriers there um, but weaving is something that that we all just make sense of and we all understand so and it's very quiet and meditative so it kind of gets us it gets us together again um, yes I, I'm keeping it nice and short but um yeah right <laughs> right um, yes yes so I guess if you have any questions on how it's made uh, you can always just ask me. Um, there's a great uh, exhibition, if you want to learn for yourself, there's a great exhibition over at the Fabric Workshop Museum that has looms that you can practice on uh, with the Sonia Clark um, uh, Monumental Cloth Exhibition. So if you want to get into your own weaving practice, I recommend going there. And also come to the African American Museum and to the Color Girls Museum. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, got to adjust this. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Daisy. I had the pleasure of meeting Hannah. Um, and the piece I'm reading is called Heritage and it was inspired by a lot of my experiences and then what I saw um, from what Hannah shared with me. San Sebastián harvests centuries of ancestral history and sits in the mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico. I visited this village recently with my dad. He was returning to his childhood after 10 years while I only visited once before as a baby. A bittersweet reunion for him, a beautiful revelation for me. In the absence of phone reception, my family's crops, shared meals, and love nourished my soul. My dad taught me how to di differentiate between native bushes and fruit trees. My grandma's cooking routine informed my sense of time. Stories of past family members came to life. The stark contrast to mainstream U.S. culture were clear, but my connection to the past overpowered the differences. On her last day there, my grandma made the most delicious caldo I'd ever had. Scalding hot broth with steamed vegetables and soft tortillas to accompany the rooster she had killed that morning. Each ingredient came from my grandparents' cultivation and careful planning. Such has been the way of life for generations. Hannah Leanne Wallace is a fifth generation loom weaver. Her mountains are made of old clothing and blankets, among other materials she and her mother repurpose, and piles of rugs. They hide away in the rug room, a chamber of creation located in the basement of her mother's Eastern Pennsylvania home. The rugs are woven in the company of silence, conversation, or music. They reflect their creator's skill in their display, outdoors, in cars, around the house, and in the homes of family members and family friends. The craft begun with Hannah's great-great-great-grandmother in Minnesota and has been preserved through self-instruction and hours of practice. Weaving allows current day Hannah to spend time with her mother, Joyce Leon Wallace, and her ancestors, Mary Jane Johnson, John O. Johnson, and the very first family loom weaver, Hannah Johnson. My relationship with cooking started when my mom noticed that the balls I shaped from Play-Doh actually resembled spheres instead of lumps. I was tasked with crafting the roditas, balls of masa needed to make tortillas. My mom began imparting her culinary wisdom on me when I was 12 around the time I no longer needed a stool to reach the stove's back burner. She stuck to the basics, rice, beans, quesadillas. I avoided elaborate meals until I was 16. I knew I'd struggle to adopt the same flow that the women in my family had mastered. In the kitchen, their teachings are unstructured. There are no measuring tools and no set cooking times, no room to improvise. Complex dishes require more than a day to prepare use no less than five spices, and demand proper execution of each step. 
My mom's recipes and procedures are derived from her own experiences and my grandma's tips. I haven't yet been able to balance flavors or recall procedures as well as she does, but she says I'm still learning, so there's still hope. As a child, Hannah's small hands and stature were unfit for the daunting loom, but this didn't prevent her from stunning her mother as she cut and created, sewed and wove. When rug making begins and ends is tricky to describe. Weaving itself is a swift process, but this doesn't include the preparation of the materials, much of what 16-year-old Hannah spent time doing. In order to weave, each strip of cut fabric is sewn together until it is the desired length and then wrapped around a shuttle. Learning to operate the loom was difficult, as a right-handed mother tried to teach her left-handed daughter the larger movements. Even so, practice made her relationship with the loom blossom. According to her mom, Hannah's first rug was actually pretty good. <laughs> now that I'm in college, bonding time with my mom includes cooking and grocery shopping. She has the ultimate shopping strategy, created and refined after 20 years of living in Yakima, Washington. She knows which stores and markets offer the best priced meat, where to find the freshest produce, and even what days of the week her favorite locations stock the ingredients she needs. I inherited this wisdom and still rely on it when I return home, in case she entrusts me with the shopping list. But I admit that I'm spoiled. It's more likely now that she'll ask me what food I'm craving instead of asking me to buy groceries. But on the day she's especially busy, I'm left to get a head start on her plans to feed the small army that is our family. She'll rush out the door, yelling instructions and for me to call her if I have any questions. As a challenge to myself, and to prove that I have inherited some culinary ability, I make it a point not to call. Since moving to Philadelphia, Hannah's visits to the loom and her mom are less frequent. The rugs that have claimed a place in Hannah's home are made by her mother, reminders of the ties she has to our family. Though Hannah is still transitioning from apprentice to master, it only takes her about six hours to complete a rug. Four hours preparing the material and two hours at the loom. She is the first in her family to introduce the rugs to the commercial world, sharing them via Etsy, Instagram, small business venues, and the African American Museum in Philadelphia. Lucky buyers have been granted the gift of witnessing part of her history. We find pride in heritage. The links to our past are woven into us so deeply that we unknowingly, or perhaps very intentionally, recreate them for future generations. The things we craft don't need to last forever. The spirits of our ancestors have survived in life and beyond it, and we continue to live and breathe tradition. Sam, you're up. Hello, everyone. Sorry. My voice may not sound as better on microphone, so bear with me. What I'm going to present is an excerpt of what I wrote about my encounter with Miss Johnson, and I hope you really love it. So. Christina Johnson is an, Amer an African-American West Philadelphia fiber artist focused on relaying traditional African-American quilting techniques and cultural values. Ms. Johnson is impact-driven, and she is determined to make a positive change in the community of Philadelphia. She has been long interested in using her work to promote healing and offer comfort. She, she created quilts and pillowcases for children with cancer at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She has worked with cancer patients, HIV-infected women, and with Alzheimer patients to create memory blocks for quills. I'm a good person, and I'm looking for good people, she says. When I asked Ms. Johnson about why she launched her project, she told me, I have a granddaughter that I wish to see growing up in a better world than mine. I see the teens nowadays and how they speak and behave, not only with each other, but with their elderly. And I think to myself, I want to see her grow into the better version of herself. The way she can implement the positive change that is needed in this world. That is the kind of legacy I want to leave behind. I knew where this was coming from, because she has been a teaching artist for many years, 
with the Philadelphia School System, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and elsewhere. But what I didn't know was why did it become about legacy? You know, I was once a guest teacher in high school here in Philadelphia. I was excited to embark on this journey, around, uh, but I was really surprised with the quality of the students. They were talking in a gruesome way around me and saying profanely like it was nothing. When I blamed them for doing that, they just said sorry like it would fix what they did. So I walked away from that classroom and never returned, and I could only think of how I can change that reality. That's how she started to work with children and expand the learning environment beyond the classroom and included it both in her fiber art craft and in her daily life. Can you believe that teens nowadays call Malcolm X Malcolm 10? She said. I couldn't help but start laughing to be honest. I was once in an elevator and there was this group of kids discussing African American history and they mentioned Malcolm 10. Oh boy, I felt an urge to intervene and tell them to go home and do their homework about the national and cultural figure of Malcolm X. By the time our conversation came to an end, I felt refreshed. I loved diving deep into Ms. Johnson's perspective about her life and her work. To be honest, when we talked about positive change, I was a bit pessimistic about it because I often think that nowadays, doing good has an increasingly limited space in this world, and that most people will just opt for what suits them best. Talking to Ms. Johnson restored some faith in people in me. Indeed, one person can only do as much good work, but one candle can light up a dark room. Thank you. Good evening, Christina Johnson, and uh, I am really pleased to be here. Um, I left a community in California, so I'm a transplant to Philadelphia. Oh, I'm sorry. I left a community in California, so I'm a transplant here in Philadelphia, but I have found a real community here also. So I want to thank you for inviting me here tonight. Um, Ashaki, who was up before me, and um, Betty Lee Craft are both sister quilters and friends, and I've known them now 26 plus years. So, this is home now. <laughs> um, most of my work has come to me as an artist by word of mouth. I'm one of those who came up through corporate America, who did crafts on the side, and then when I moved here, I realized I don't know any women here. My mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, two sister-in-laws, and one friend. So I needed to help build community. And so what did I want to do? I had woven in the past, <laughs> but I decided that was almost too solitary for me. I needed something more. So I loved quilts. I had purchased quilts in the past, and I thought, let's do some quilting. So I still went to take classes. I'm one of those that I need a foundation so I can do whatever I want to do before I get started good. <laughs> so that's what I did, and I became a quilter. I founded a quilting guild here in Philadelphia, Quilters of the Round Table, and we have exhibited a number of places. But what I find for me is that if I'm not giving back to community, I'm not really doing what I was put here to do. So for me, um, I'm gonna talk about the quilt now. So you, well, I started with, one woman came to me and said, how would you like to work with HIV infected women? Of course, my thought was, I don't think so. I don't know a whole lot about them, but I sure have heard a whole lot of negative things that might happen. So first things, a social worker 
actually met with me and an art therapist, and we talked about what my fears were. And that was probably the best thing that happened because it's like you could shed away all the stuff and do the art. So I had nine women that were HIV infected. There was one woman in particular, and it's not in, it's not in this quilt because this was my quilt that I produced to be hung at World AIDS Day in 2005. But if you look at the center, what do you see? Little eye chart? I brought this quilt because what Sam said to me at one of our meetings was, it reminds me of the things that we look at and we don't really see. So you can put it down. <laughs> oh, you can show the back. Oh, okay. Because the, I, I'm one of those that has to have the back and front match and do something funny. Okay. Yeah. So just a little bit more about, you can put it down now, thank you. But that was my piece I wanted to share. But I think the thing about the community was is that with the nine women, that I'm not going to talk a lot about their whole story because it's personal. But there was one woman who just, I used the word, she nagged my heart. And the reason she did is because she worked nights. She had four small children. Her husband had brought the disease home to her and then left. Her father babysat while she worked at night but she was bound and determined to come to our nine week class to just do a block about the story of her life. And I thought, wow, you know, and you could see she was tired, but the, the more I saw that she was tired, the more I decided I needed to lift up because we were gonna do this. <laughs> and about after the seventh week, one day she didn't show up. And of course, your heart just kind of goes, all right, where is she? And I understand there's some incidents that happen with people who are HIV infected, but I thought, what do I do? Well, I had talked to her enough that I knew if she couldn't come back, I could complete her piece and feel that she also was in that piece. And that's what I had to do because she didn't come back. And I don't know why I never saw any of the women again. But I think that one, as an artist, that once you commit yourself, or once I commit myself, I don't want to just say you, <laughs> but I commit myself, then the end product has got to be the best it can be for them, not just for me. And the whole time you're teaching, and so for me, one, I, I'm focusing on this because it's probably one of the best things I feel I ever did and I accomplished was for this young woman and this group of women to be heard and seen. We have one more artist to come up, and that's Joy Uday who was one of the first people who said yes when I reached out to artists all around the Philadelphia area and said, hey, I'm going to do this thing with my class. Would you come and meet with them? And you just said yes. I loved that. So this is our last speaker. And then I hope that afterwards, maybe there'll be a little mingling. You'll meet some of the people who spoke tonight. Say hello. And oh, oh, I'm so wrong. There are two more people. Sorry, Christina. Do you want to switch? We're the last one. What? We're the last one. Right. Go ahead, Joy. And then Christina. <laughs> so good evening. Hi. Um, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Joy. Um, I'm Joy Oude. And um, I want to thank Lisa. And I want to thank Erin, my student. There she is in the back. Um, I had some really great conversations with her about identity and process. And it was really wonderful to get to know her. And um, I was really um, excited to be invited to be part of this class project. So. 
Um, my background, I am a fibers mixed media artist and first a designer. Um, I worked in fashion design for five years after undergrad and I'm also an educator. I currently teach at um, Independent Seaport Museum as the STEAM educator, so mixing technology and right now I'm preparing like lessons for e-textiles, so I'm trying to bring a new generation of kids and makers into a place where they feel comfortable with the technology. Um, but I've also taught so many traditional craft workshops, Shibori Dime, um, Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Uh, I taught at Tyler School of Art uh, at um, the Blackwell Library. I actually taught a coiled bowl working uh, workshop with a collaborator based off of a show we did at the Colored Girls Museum and um, just different places around the city, Please Touch Museum, um, Stephen F. Austin University in Texas. So um, teaching is something that is um, just really an important part of my practice. I had some amazing teachers growing up and I never thought I would get into education even fully sort of part-time, but it's something that ended up happening, which shouldn't have been a surprise because my mom was a teacher when I was younger. Um, and the way that I got into fibers is actually sort of roundabout. I was um, a very bookish and nerdy kid who actually really enjoyed embroidery. I found my mom's Reader's Digest book one day and just sort of freaked out and tried to learn everything in the book. So embroidery, macrame, I remember going to Michael's one time with her and crying because she wouldn't buy me a latch hook kit that was a unicorn and I sort of lost it and she like was like, you need to calm down and then she went back and got it for me. But um, I've always had an interest in fiber processes, but um, as a kid of immigrants, my parents, my family is Nigerian, we're Igbo. Um, that was not a career option, that was a hobby and something that you did like when you were in between doing homework or you were in between doing projects. So my original career track was actually um, pediatric neurosurgery. <laughs> and then I got to my first semester of college and remembered that sometimes people don't make it through surgery successfully and I knew that emotionally I could not deal with that. So I had to figure out something else and I came back to my love of design, even though it was very informal, I'd never taken any art classes as a young person because, again, that was not a career-oriented thing. So I would do it at home, but not in school. Um, I ended up creating a portfolio of work, getting into my fashion program, and doing that. Um, and while I really enjoyed the design part of it, there was something really missing for me. In school, you make, you sew. As a designer in corporate design, you, you never sew, essentially. And so after five years of doing this, I realized what I was missing was the process of making. I enjoy making really tedious work. I don't know uh, if the slides, slide? yeah. Do you want to, oh. you move the podium? Yeah, probably, so I'm not Here. blocking it. Thank you. Um, so in my work, um, specifically my thesis work when I went back to school, I was coming off of having been out of school for about five years. And what I found I was missing was conversation, critical conversation about society and things that I was missing um, in the fashion design world. I wasn't really having deep conversations with people. And so I started thinking about um, sort of socioeconomic issues of black culture as it you know, is part of American culture. And this is one of the pieces I made for my thesis show, which is called Clark Dolls. And it's based off the really well-known Clark Doll study uh, that was conducted by Kenneth and Mamie Clark in the late 30s and 40s. And this version, um, I decided to make basically this very visually statistical map where you're seeing basically 79 dolls. And there's a sample of it on the table out there you might have seen when you came in. Um, I applique every single one of these dolls um, by sewing machine by hand. I cut out all their faces and their hair and their, their clothing by hand. It was the better part of two years of my three-year program. Um, they are my children, and I had to stop looking at them for a long time after I made them. It took up a large part of my, my thesis work. But um, essentially, I was trying to create a visually just statistical map to show you the lack of representation um, in every iteration of the study, even now, what they find is that black children simply devalue themselves as compared to white children in America. And in 2019, it's really depressing to know that that's still the majority thought that comes out of that study. So to me, I wanted to make dolls that were not 
plush and they were not really accessible, you don't touch them, they're on the wall, but you're just seeing all of this information. Um, and you see all of their heads, all of the white dolls' heads are tilted in a certain direction and they're all smiling. And my one lovely little doll, I also made hand cut and hydro pressed all, you can turn the doll on the table over um, out of copper. I made all of the wall hangings by hand, which is why it took me two years. Um, so you can take a look at that, but um, it was really important to me. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see that all of my work, um, not my, <laughs> all of my work is very tedious in nature. To me, um, it's not just pattern and color that's important, but repetition. Um, to me, by repeating the process that I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, whether it's embroidery, um, most recently I'm making a lot of lace by hand, so I learned how to tat. Um, from books, and it's important to me to learn how to do traditional craft work. It's not something in my family history that exists. There is in Nigeria, of course, a dinkra. There's the Dutch wax cloth you see, that, but that's really European. So it's not Nigerian, but it's something you see Nigerian people making. So in creating my own sort of, um, I guess I would call it, portfolio of the techniques I'm working in, it's important to me not just to learn the traditional way that you are doing things, but then to apply it in a way that speaks to whatever I'm trying to discuss conceptually and then open up a conversation about it. Um, so that's just the side view of those dolls. So I also whip stitched around um, the dolls to these uh, CNC routed backs that I made on the, the CNC router. Um, and then coming out of my thesis work, I was talking a lot, not just about things like the Clark doll study, but about mammy caricatures. I was talking about the divisive icons that existed in American culture. All this was really important to me because I grew up with parents that knew nothing of racism until they came to this country. Um, and yet my brothers and I were confronted with these things on a regular basis. And it was, it's something that I, we didn't really talk to our parents about because they didn't have a vocabulary and a context for it. And we knew it was more burdensome and just really hard for them to conceive of how to guide us because they knew nothing of how to deal with it. And so it wasn't really, I didn't have conversations about these, thing, these things with my um, parents until I was well out of undergrad. Um, and so when I was making my thesis work with Mammy caricatures, talking about the gollywog and why it was acceptable to people at a time to be using this, my mom was like, when are you going to stop making sad work? <laughs> like, she still did not understand why I was talking about these things. And it, I had to explain to her that it was part of my history along with my Nigerian history of my family. Um, and then going into We'll blow through these next ones because I'm running out of time. This ideation book is also all on the table. Um, coming out of my thesis work, I really wanted to sort of talk about uh, culture loss um, and identity because it played such a large part in how I considered the world and how I moved through the world. So these images, this is my mom. Um, she's um, in her cap and gown from graduation. And this is my dad with my paternal grandfather. His face is prominently featured in this series, Omission in Print. And so you can see the Dutch wax cloth um, that is cut and then embroidered into through the photographs. And we can just keep moving through the next couple. And so these are family members, my mom and my Aunt Lily, and more stitching. And then another page, the, my parents. This is, my dad is in America here, I think, in Oklahoma. But my mom is definitely in Nigeria here at her college. Um, and so these were just the beginning process for me to make the next series that I worked on coming out of grad school. Um, which we can go to the next slide. Um, and that's called Omission in Print. Again, this is my grandfather's face. He died when my mom was, um, oh no, this is my, sorry, my dad's dad. He died actually when I was about eight, but I still remember his face. I was able to go to Nigeria when I was like five and meet him. And even though he didn't really speak much English, there was a sort of vocabulary and way that we found to communicate while I was visiting, which meant a lot to me. Um, and so all of these yellow marks that you're seeing here, that's all embroidery. Um, and that's five layers of fabric, burlap, um, Pellon stabilizer in the back to hold the organic edges, um, and the Dutch wax cloth, the image transfer underneath. And we can keep moving, there's a detail, so you can see closer. <coughs> so all of the yellow is embroidery, um, satin stitch, and then bullion knots, which look like little sprinkles, and they are very terrible to do over and over again. By the time I finish, there are eight wall hangings and eight dresses that accompany them. And by the time I finish the work, I'm allergic to nickel. Um, my hands were just full of holes <laughs> from working on all this stuff. The next one is going to be uh, my mother's mother, who is 
still alive and 108 years old. I saw her in December and we celebrated her. Um, and she is featured in the four matriarch sides. So my grandfather, those pieces are called chief and it's one through four. And then matriarch one through four for my um, maternal grandmother. And then there's another detail shot after that. Um, so French knots, more um, running stitches. And then all of the spaces in between the brown was fabric. So I'm doing a lot of reverse applique going across those pieces. Um, and then the last, this is the current series that I'm working on. And this is called Lily Whitewash. And it's addressing, um, in every country really except for America, these um, skin lightening soaps are really prevalent. They are prevalent in India, in Asia, in Africa. Um, and it's basically just calling out how very toxic the culture is and basically repeatedly telling women, in order to be valued, you need to be fairer. Um, and these soaps contain things like mercury. They contain um, chemicals that cause um, beyond just like nausea and just immediate like sicknesses, like uh, unvisible things like um, anxiety. They cause Alzheimer's in some cases they've been linked to. They definitely cause schizophrenia. And so people are just washing their skins with these soaps. Um, this first iteration of the project, I did make the soap myself with charcoal and um, coconut oil base. And over last summer, they all crystallized because the humidity and the heat made them sweat. And so um, for a show I had promised them for, I remade all of them again, including the lace, which um, making one cage for each of these pieces probably takes about four hours, <laughs> I remade 25 of them and then had to recast it in urethane resin. So again, talking about doing things over and over again until you feel that you've perfected it. Um, but obviously, besides the doily underneath, which is also very irregular, it's not like a regular one, you would never see the lace tatted in such a way that it's in encasing anything. Um, so again, trying to take those traditional crafts and turn them on their head so that I'm using them in the way that I want to conceptually. And then I think the next few slides, there's an overhead view. So you can see that's 28 of them stacked together. Um, and then the last view is just a detail of the lace up close. So I think my time is up. But thank you very much. <laughs> about knitting. And it's not just knitting the yarns itself, 
but also where the yarns are from. What kind of sheep do we have in the United States? Why are we not using yarns and small farms um, in around our area? So I did my research and I found a few small farms. <coughs> I live in Wayne, Pennsylvania, which is very close to Valley Forge. Well, about five miles down the street from me in Pottstown, and um, I found a small farm which had quite a few Shetland sheep. So as I talked to this, um, as I talked to the farmer, she's a woman, and she owns her small farm. She told me every year when she sheared her sheep, her sheep, the texture of her wool can be different depending on the weather, depending on how much rain we get, what kind of feed her sheep are able to eat. Is it grass or is it just the dry stuff that we get, the pellets? It affects the wool, it affects how the sheep is feeling. When the sheep feels good and happy and treated nicely, her leaves are gonna be gorgeous. I'm not lying about that. Just go out and you know, go to one of those like sheep and wool festival and talk to the farmers. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought that it would be really interesting to show off um, her Shetland in all their glory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this is from locally made um, fleece. And when we got there, I got about, I don't know, maybe 20 pounds of uh, fleas, took it to um, a mill in Pennsylvania run by another woman. I thought that, oh, wait, there's a pattern here. Mm -hmm. You know, my partner and I, uh, my business partner and I, my yarn soulmate is also a woman. So we thought, oh, let's see how far we can go with this woman thing, you know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes, we found like three farmers who are women. We found two mills who are run by women. They are all, yes, all in Pennsylvania. Who knew, right? <laughs> and you thought it's just this. It's not. So um, that's why we went to a couple more farms and then we found Romadale and Corridale. They also come in different colors. So, and when I say, how do I knit and I express my feelings? I don't knit with a pattern. So when I knitted this, this is a feral method. I look at my yarns, I look at them, and I thought in my head how I can start. So I thought I start with the brown, and then I go up and see which color it will come to me. I let the yarn speak to me. Mm -hmm. I also let the yarn, like, you know, that day if I'm not feeling too good, I will stick with something that is very simple, just lines. But my undergrad degree has also taught me that math comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you make stripes more attractive? The Fibonacci theorem. Mm -hmm. Try it out, and for all knitters out there, if you're doing stripes, try the Fibonacci theorem and the golden ratio. You'll be surprised how those math come into play together, and it will look visually appealing. So um, that's what I do. So see this little part there that is a little wonky? Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling too good <laughs> that week. I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not liking this. You know, I'm kind of like, ugh. So when I see this sweater, I always like, and not just this sweater, there are others too. Um, I, I, I can recall like, you know, what am I feeling that day or that week? Was I happy? Was I being playful? Because there's a lot of things here that are playful to me. And I did go back to become calmer and then going back to stripes. And then I got bored, so I just did all this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, it could happen. It's a big sweater, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, after a while, you're just like, oh, I just want to finish this thing. <laughs> um, so this comes from an artist. I went to Vogue Bidding, and um, there was a ceramic artist there, and um, I brought this sweater to her, and I was just like, I don't know what kind of button I want. Mm. So we were looking around, and I thought, oh, I think the green one then. It doesn't really match the rest, but you know what? 
The sheep had green grass for food, right? <laughs> so why not? <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, artists. Thank you, audience. Thank you, students. Thank you, Kelly Writers House. Thank you, Creative Writing Program. Um, take a look at all, at all the what? What? Mm -mm. We're good. <laughs> We're good. Um, so please mill around. That's it. Thanks.